So the notes for the nervous system um, are kind of spread out. It's just the way the PowerPoint that came with this textbook was laid out. So um, it seems like there's a lot, but the concepts are, um, are much less than the number of PowerPoint pages. So we'll be turning pages a lot just because there's not as much as there seems. So first concept is what makes nerve cells special? What makes nerve cells special is that they're irritable irritable, which means they can respond, they can change their resting membrane potential with a stimulus. So if they're stimulated, they can change their resting membrane potential. And I don't know if you remember what resting membrane potential means, but that just means the charge, the balance of ions across the membrane. So make sure you write that down. I just gave you a specific definition that would be on the test. And if you didn't write it down and then you're studying your notes and you get it wrong, you'll say, well, how did that happen? Because you didn't write it down. It means they can respond or they can change their resting membrane potential with a stimulus. So if we stimulate a nerve cell, it can change its resting membrane potential and cause ions to flow. Remember talking about that in general A&P, the sodium potassium pump, sodium channels opening up first, right? Sodium flows into the cell until it becomes really positive. And when it hits plus 30, then potassium channels open and then potassium flows out of the cell. We're going to review those concepts a little bit today. So we need an adequate stimulus, which means we need enough stimulus to reach threshold in order to get that special impulse called an action potential that continues on down the membrane undiminished until it reaches the axon terminals, causes a neurotransmitter to be released, and then it carries on, on on its way, right? So action potentials are kind of an all or none thing. It's like shooting off the gun at a horse track, pops open the channels, and off they go. The horses go around the track, right? So that's how an action potential works. So the impulse is always the same, regardless of the stimulus. So when, once we fire an action potential, it travels down the membrane, whether it's light in the optic nerve, um, a sound transmission, a vibration in the vestibular cochlear nerve, or it might be touch sensation in a sensory nerve of your fingertip. Regardless of what caused the stimulus, once we reach threshold and open up those ion channels, down that action potential goes to the, to the axon terminals. So these ion channels are proteins, remember? There's leak channels that are always open, and there's gated channels that only open when there's special conditions going on around the cell. So leak channels we call non-gated channels. They're just always open. And we have leak channels for potassium and for sodium. But there's gated channels. There's three types of gated channels. There's chemically gated channels or ligand gated. Have you heard ligand gated before? OK. So that's when a chemical has to bind to that channel. For example, a neurotransmitter has to bind to the protein on the membrane, and then the channel opens. And the chemical, most cases, is a neurotransmitter like acetylcholine. Remember talking about acetylcholine in general AMP, ACH. Uh, norepinephrine is another one. Epinephrine, those are things that have to bind to a protein in order to open up that channel and let those ions in. Voltage-gated channels just means there has to be some change in ion charge on either side of the membrane. And when it reaches a certain level, it opens up a channel. And I'll give you examples of all these. So, And then mechanically gated means you have to morph the cell membrane and it pushes the channel open. For example, when we look at our skin, when you touch your skin or something is crawling across the surface, it's morphing that cell membrane a little bit, opening up ion channels and sending a sensation impulse, an action potential up the sensation pathway to your brain to say, oh, that tickles or that hurts if someone's pressing hard enough, right? So we have receptors in our eyeball, like I said, that are stimulated by light. So if you're able to visually see everything in the room today, your receptors are working, your photoreceptors, right? But try closing your eyes and pressing on your eyelids really hard and tell me if you see light as you press harder. So just close your eyes. 
press on your eyelids. Does it get bright the harder you press? Yes? Did you try it? <laughs> That's because if you press on photoreceptors hard enough, you're morphing the membrane and it's sending light signals. You're not seeing anything, it just is bright when you do that because it's sending light signals to your brain. So you're morphing the membrane and stimulating and allowing ions to flow to cause that stimulus or that sensation of light. So three types of gated channels, and these are really important for controlling what's coming in and out of our nervous system for processing. There's a lot of impulses that come in to our sensory receptors that never reach threshold, so they never go on to the brain for processing. And thank goodness for that, right? We don't need to feel every single thing in our environment. And our brain is also good at ignoring certain sensations. Like with me, I have six children, and when I had all of them in the house at once, there'd be a lot of noise, you know, a lot of crying and mom and, you know, things like that. And after a while, you just turn, you tend to ignore, those of you with kids, right? You tend to ignore the mom, well, who cares, they'll figure it out, right? When it's mom, then it's like, what? You get scared, you go running, right? You know the moms that are important and the moms that are like, oh, they'll figure it out in a minute, right? Same thing with your dogs, right? When they're barking or growling and playing, you know it's fine. But when it turns into that vicious growl and it's a ball of hair and fur, then you know you have to get involved. So a big problem in healthcare is alarm fatigue. What happens if you would live in a or work on a busy unit where there's a lot of bed alarms going off, and a lot of alarms just for like, you know, CO2 levels, heart rates, whatever you start to realize all oh, that alarm will go away. Because that's what happens. People lift their butt up for a minute and they turn over and the alarm goes off. So you hear this and after a while you just don't respond to it. Well, that's dangerous, right? Because sometimes those alarms can indicate someone's standing up and they're gonna fall and we better get there in a hurry. So it's, it's, it's a problem how we can become desensitized over time when we have continuous stimulation. One thing that we don't desensitize over time, and you should definitely know this for the test, and that is pain. We don't desensitize to pain. We can cope with pain, we can learn how to cope with it, but we'll always feel it because pain is a protective mechanism. If we, if we don't respond to pain and we don't feel it anymore, that's dangerous because that's our body's alarm signal saying something's wrong. And that's why if you're exercising and you have pain with exercising, you don't run through pain. That means there's an injury, and if you continue to run on injury, it's going to get worse and worse and worse, right? So, all right. So, these, the, mes the resting membrane potential is something that all cells have. But again, muscle cells and nerve cells can change their resting membrane potential. So, nerve cells require a stimulus, and that stimulus can be light, it can be pressure, it can be sound, all different things. So they can change their permeability of the membrane to allow ions to flow and change this number. But the number that you should know is negative 70. The inside of the cell is 70 millivolts more negative than the outside of the cell. So we see more negatively charged ions inside the cell than we see outside the cell. The reason why it's more negative inside the cell is we have more diffusion of potassium out of the cell membrane. That's because if we look at the cell, this is our cell membrane, we have different types of channels. We have leak channels for potassium. We have leak channels for sodium. And we have gated channels for sodium. So there's a gate on the inside and the outside. And we have gated channels for potassium. So leak channels are always open, right? But we also have another interesting protein. I'm going to make it, well, I'll just 
we have another thing that will dump potassium, I'm sorry, we'll dump sodium out of the cell, and it brings potassium into the cell. It's a special pump and it requires ATP. So it'll take three sodium and dump it out of the cell, and it'll take two potassium and bring it into the cell. So what do we call that thing? Do you remember from general A&P? Yeah, the sodium-potassium pump. So it's constantly dumping sodium out using the help of ATP, and it's constantly bringing potassium in. So what, what would you expect, if, where would you expect to find more potassium then if we have these pumps? Yeah, inside the cell. So this is the inside of the nerve cell. Okay, so we're going to see more potassium inside the cell. And what would you expect to see more of outside the cell? Sodium, because it's constantly being dumped out. So we're going to see more sodium outside the cell. So because of that, when we have leak channels, which way does potassium want to leak? Because of the, the pump constantly bringing it in, if there's a leak channel, which way is it going to go by natural diffusion? Out, high to low concentration, right? So potassium is always wanting to leave the cell, and sodium is always wanting to enter the cell based on their concentration gradients. And the pump is constantly just doing its thing, upsetting the apple cart, right, by bringing more sodium out and potassium in. So we see this constant diffusion of sodium and potassium because they're built up because of that pump. But now we add extra doors with the sodium channel that's gated. I'll add it right here, sodium. So we have a gated sodium channel here. We have a gated potassium channel here. So when I change the charge on the membrane, I can open up extra doors for sodium and potassium. So how do I open up extra doors? Well, there has to be a stimulus, right? So the stimulus part of the membrane, I'm going to move to this picture here. The stimulus part of the membrane is out here on the dendrites. You remember that from general a &P? This is the sensory portion on the, on the neuron. So this is where, it's like the antenna. This is where information comes in. So out on these dendrites, we have specialized sensory receptors. And these sensory receptors respond to heat, touch, light, sound, taste, smell. Think of all the sensations we get in the body, right? Those are all specialized, depending where the nerve cells are, if they're in the nose or the tongue or the eye or the ear, they're specialized to receive an impulse, a stimulus, a stimulus to generate an impulse. And that impulse comes in through the dendrites and builds up and if it reaches, if it causes enough ion channels to open for that cell inside to become negative, what is threshold according to our textbook? It's on page 65. Look on page 65. What is it? Yeah, negative 55. So if it reaches threshold at negative 55 millivolts, we have voltage-gated channels that are stimulated on the axon. So on the axon, underneath, what are these blue things here? Myelin, yeah, Schwann cells producing myelin, right? So underneath this myelin on the axon are channels, voltage-gated channels for potassium and sodium that when the, the number of ion flow causes the resting membrane potential to reach negative 55, all the voltage-gated channels in series on this axon open extra and cause excess, well, what, what opens first? Do you remember that? Look at your um, picture on 60, your diagram on 65 on the bottom. The depolarization, do you remember what happens first? When we reach threshold, all the choices, sodium or potassium, do you remember? 
Yeah, all the sodium channels open first. Because they're, and why is that? Because voltage gated sodium channels are stimulated to open at negative 55. So if you go back to our notes here, if I can find them. Yeah, so all the, the different types of channels we have, voltage gated, so we can just write that, voltage gated sodium channels, they open at negative 55. millivolts. It's really hard to write with this mouse. And potassium channels, they open at, at the top of our action potential graph, at plus, remember what the number is? Plus 30 millivolts. Thanks for trying. So plus 30. So that's when those open. So all we have to do is stimulate those dendrites to open up enough specialized sodium channels that are, again, they open by morphing the membrane, mechanical, touch, temperature, light, whatever. Those are sensory endings, the dendrites are. If we get enough ion flow, get enough change in the membrane, we reach what we call threshold, and those sodium channels open. So when sodium channels open, a bunch of sodium comes into the cell and it gets really positive inside the cell, right? Because we have all this extra flow of sodium coming through these voltage-gated sodium channels here. So if I look at my graph, I'm hanging out at negative 70. We get a little stimulus at the dendrite. So this little upshoot here, this is what we call a graded potential. That area there is a graded potential, which means it's a special type of stimulus causing ion flow, but it's not enough to actually travel down the neuron and stimulate the brain to respond. So between negative 70 and negative 55, we have a graded potential. And then we hit negative 55, all the channels on the membrane open up on the, on the axon. And then when it gets to plus 30, we get enough sodium in the cell that it's plus 30 those voltage-gated sodium channels close, and the potassium ones open. Remember we said they open at plus 30. In which way does potassium want to flow? Out. So if we open up extra channels for potassium, potassium's going to flow out of the cell. And what's going to happen to the number in here? Is it going to stay positive if we're losing a bunch of, bunch of positive charge? No, it's going to become negative again until we hit negative 70, then it all starts over. But sometimes those potassium channels are a little slow to close, just like if you have a Black Friday special on TVs and you say the first 100 can come in and get the free TV. If they're trying to shut the door, you think more than 100 people might sneak in? Yeah. So that's what happens with potassium. Those doors, those channels, uh, the, the doors on the channel are slow to close and a little bit of potassium leaks out extra. So we have this hyperpolarization at number four, where that arrow is. That's just because of slow closing potassium channels. And then what's going to clean things up and put everything back in place after this impulse is done? What's, yeah, very good, the sodium potassium pump. So the sodium potassium pump established the resting membrane potential. Then we have a stimulus. We open up doors, sodium comes in, then potassium flows out. And then the sodium, and then everything closes, and, the, and we're resting again. There's no more stimulus. Then the sodium potassium pump cleans things up, and we're back at negative 70 for our resting membrane potential. So I'm going to pause the video here to give you a chance to watch the animation on YouTube about the um, action potential. It's in our folder. Okay, so there's two types of signals that travel down ions or uh, axons and cells, nerve cells. Graded potentials start at the dendrites, and unless we continue to stimulate those dendrites, the ion channels will open at the dendrites, and they'll shut, and the, and the impulse will fizzle out. So these can go in two different directions on the membrane, 
and they fizzle out. Unless we continue to stimulate and reach threshold, then it becomes the next type of signal, which is an action potential. So it's kind of like, think about it, it's like pulling the string on a lawnmower, right? You pull, and you pull, and you pull, and then finally the engine starts, right? So the pulls that lead up to the engine start, those are like graded potentials. So there's ion movement, there's action going on, but there's no firing yet, right? And the only way to stop the engine is to turn it off, right? So that's kind of how graded potentials are. We have to keep stimulating the membrane to get enough ion flow to reach that negative 55 and there's a special spot on the membrane where an action potential starts. Does anybody remember that from general A and P? There's a special spot on the membrane right here, right where it starts to narrow, but before it narrows and becomes the axon. It's called the axon no, <laughs> axon terminal is down here. This is, maybe you didn't talk about this in general AMP. This is called the axon hillock, H-I-L-L-O-C-K. If you had me for general AMP, you knew it. <laughs> but every, we all are different. Like I said, we all focus on different details, so it's not a big deal. So anyway, axon hillock is where the action potential starts. So that's where all this ion and this, this, this threshold is achieved is at the axon hillock. Then we have all voltage gated channels down the membrane that will fire and one after another, sodium then potassium, sodium then potassium and my action potential reaches the end which is the axon terminal. Just like an airport terminal, right, is where you get on your, is where the gates are and that's where you get on your plane. So axon terminals is where the end of that action potential is going to be and it's going to cause a release of neurotransmitters at the end. So we have all in synaptic vesicles in the end of this neuron are neurotransmitters being stored waiting for release but they need, a neuro, they need an action potential to stimulate that release. If we don't reach threshold out here at the axon hillock, nothing happens and these graded potentials fizzle out. Okay, so back to our PowerPoint then. So they're short-lived, they're localized, they're at the dendrites and they can go upward or downward, right? So if they are depolarizations, we call them, what again? This is a little later in your notes. We call them excitatory postsynaptic potentials, or EPSPs. And if they are downward, we call them IPSPs. These are examples of graded potentials that go away from threshold. So here's a particular part of the membrane that's been stimulated. We see movement of ions this direction and this direction because they're small movements and they're not activating voltage-gated channels and they're going to fizzle out. But again, an action potential occurs only in muscle cells and neurons. These are the cells that are irritable, that they can change their stimulus, or sorry, sorry, change their resting membrane potential with a stimulus. So these are long distance neural communication, which means they can go a long ways all the way to the brain to be processed when we're starting at the toe, for example. So this is our graph of an action potential. Remember depolarization, what's moving with depolarization? Yeah, sodium is moving what direction in the cell? It's becoming more positive because you see this is going upward toward the positive value. So sodium is going into the cell. And here, in the repolarization, what's happening? Potassium is moving in what direction? Out of the cell. Yep, so potassium is going out of the cell. And that's why it's becoming more negative. And then the hyperpolarization, remember, is caused by what? Yep, yep. So I'm not going to write it. It's too hard to write with my cursor. <laughs> but it's slow closing potassium channels. It's extra potassium sneaking out causing hyperpolarization.
And then what cleans things up in this section right here? It won't let me do it. But this spot right, right here, yep, the sodium potassium pump is cleaning <coughs> things up, right? At this upward shoot where it's going back toward resting, it's cleaning things up. And again, Without the sodium potassium pump, we'd never be able to re-stimulate our membrane. We'd be stuck in this constant stimulus state or it'd just fizzle out and we'd never be able to get back to resting for the process to begin again. And this requires ATP. And what do we need to make ATP? We studied in cellular metabolism to get the Krebs cycle and electron transport chain to get lots of ATP. What do we need from the outside environment? Oxygen, right? Oxygen. So without oxygen, our cells cannot make ATP, and without ATP, we can't run our pumps, and if we can't run our pumps, we can't conduct nerve cells or heart muscle cells or muscle cells, and the body dies within about five minutes. So oxygen is critically important for these pumps to run. Okay, so action potentials then, we talk about a loud sound or severe pain, or bright light versus dim light. Those are all varying amounts of stimulus, right? What that means, the way we get intensity of a stimulus is by having frequent action potentials. We're stimulating, stimulating, stimulating those dendrites to continually reach threshold and have lots and lots of action potentials flying down our axons. So it's like a busy highway one car after another, bam, bam, bam. Those are action potentials, that's a loud sound. That's a bright light. Because remember, we can only get to plus 30 and the sodium channel is closed. So we can't get taller action potentials. We can only get more action potentials. So the more action potentials we have, the more intense the stimulus. And that's a test question for sure. So a loud sound looks like this. Lots of action potentials right after another. A, a quieter sound would look like this, fewer action potentials over time. You can see, here's a, st a stimulus. And if we're below threshold, do we get any action potential? If we, are, if we don't reach negative 55? Nope, we get nothing. So here there's no stimulus. Here's a little bit above threshold. We get some action potentials. And then if we have a lot of stimulus, a lot of action potentials. So it's Increasing stimulus, and this is what's highlighted here in bolded, so make sure you really pay attention and draw an asterisk and an arrow to this statement here. It's the frequency of action potentials that determines the strength of a stimulus. So if we want to slow down the number of action potentials, we have to bind neurotransmitters or medicines that inhibit the membrane inhibit and take it further from threshold. And that's what a lot of our narcotic pain medicines do, is bring it th further from threshold. So the next couple of pages are just, uh, it's a table from your textbook that compares graded potentials to action potentials. So I'll have a handout on Wednesday that, to help you compare those. So just refer to that table. We're gonna move on to the next concept. So we also have different types of neuron classifications in our bodies that carry information. So some things that determine how fast an action potential travels from, say, your fingertip to your brain for processing depends on the diameter of the axon. Which do you think would be faster, skinny neurons or large diameter neurons? Large diameter, kind of like wires coming on, in or out of your home. If you saw a broken wire coming out of your electrical box and it was really big versus a teeny tiny one coming out of your headphones, we're not too intimidated by a loose wire or open wire on our headphones, right? But a big cable going into your home, you wouldn't want to touch the wires inside that because you know there's a lot of power in there. Same thing with our axons. If they're large diameter, there's fast uh, action potential flow. So our reflexes have large diameter axons so we can have quick responses so we don't trip, for example. When you step on something sharp and your other foot jumps down and your other and the foot that's stepped on something sharp lifts up, that's a very quick response so we can respond to our environment and stay safe. 
unmyelinated, as well as myelination is another one. So myelinated axons are fast. So they're insulated axons prevent, and in, in the, in the impulse travels from node to node to node. Remember those little bare spots on the axon you learned about in general A&P? If we look at this axon, so these channels, these sodium channels are clustered here and here and here. They're not underneath that. They, the quickest conduction is to jump from node of ran V8 to node of ran V8. So it's faster if they're myelinated. If they're unmyelinated, then that action potential has to travel down the entire axon, and that slows transmission of action potentials. So it's sometimes good to have unmyelinated axons when you want a slow response, like if you're moving the digestive tract to digest food or you're contracting the bowel to have a bowel movement. You don't want rapid contraction, right? You want that to be slow. If you're releasing insulin from the pancreas, you want that, uh, that's, um, well, that's a bad example because um, that's endocrine. Um, if we're stimulating any smooth muscle via the autonomic nervous system, depending on the type of smooth muscle. Like I said, the digestive tract is a, is a good one. We want that to be slow. We don't want rapid responses in the digestive tract. So myelinated axons, faster conduction. Thicker axons, faster conduction. Multiple sclerosis is demyelination of axons in the brain and spinal cord, not out in the nerves. Out in the nerves is Guillain-Barre. De demyelination of nerves is Guillain-Barre. Demyelination of motor tracts, which is bundles of axons inside the brain and spinal cord, that's multiple sclerosis. So that's affecting every body system because it's in the brain and spinal cord. So it affects digestive function, uh, urinary function, it affects mood, it affects muscles. It's a system-wide uh, disease, autoimmune disease, that causes demyelination of axons in the brain and spinal cord. And there's a lot of research being done on what's causing it, but there's nothing definitive yet. All we know, it's demyelination, and we need to kind of slow the immune response down so the immune cells aren't attacking myelin because that's what happens. The immune system attacks myelin. It causes chronic inflammation. So people need lots of different medicines to cause, to decrease inflammation and slow the immune attack. So when we classify fibers, nerve fibers, then we look at those factors. We look at diameter, degree of myelination, and how fast impulses are conducted. So group A fibers are fast fibers. So just think of it as A, B, and C. If you've got an A in gym class, you're fast, right? If you've got a B, you're kind of fast, and if you've got a C, maybe you're just showing up. So group A fibers, large diameter, myelinated. We see these on somatic sensory motor fibers. So anything that's involved with our reflexes and moving muscles quickly in response to the environment, those are going to be group A fibers. Group E are intermediate, so they're lightly myelinated. These are autonomic nervous system fibers. Again, anytime we're talking about smooth muscle, cardiac muscle glands, we don't want real rapid responses there. So autonomic are the group B and C fibers. These are things that are under involuntary control, so they're not going to have as fast a conduction. And the group C are the smallest diameter unmyelinated <clears throat> fibers. So when you think skeletal muscle, that's the group A fibers. Because remember, somatic is skeletal muscle. And whether it's sensory or motor, so incoming or outgoing responses, those are group A fibers. So when you talk about how these things are conducted, we're talking about one neuron stimulating and the neuron after it. So the first neuron that you're zeroing in on, we call that the presynaptic neuron. And the next neuron is called the postsynaptic neuron. So it's two neurons in series. So the dendrites, the axon, and the axon terminals are, are con conducting an impulse. And then there's a space. And then you have the dendrites of the next neuron, which is called the postsynaptic ner post neuron. So just to keep it real simple, so you've got the presynaptic neuron dendrites, you've got the axon, the axon terminals, right? 
Then you have the next neuron in series. So there's the dendrites. And they're not always in a linear fashion like this, but just for simplicity's sake, we're going to show it that way. So this would be the presynaptic neuron, right? And this one is the postsynaptic neuron. And the synapse is this space here. I guess it won't let me highlight because there's nothing to highlight. So here's the synapse. So this space is where we have release of neurotransmitters from the presynaptic neuron. If we have an action potential though, right? First of all, we have to have a stimulus. So out here we have a stimulus at the dendrites, right? We need a stimulus here in the presynaptic. Then we have an action potential on the dendrites, or I'm sorry, on the axons. And then we have to release a neurotransmitter. And just for simplicity's sake, we'll just say it's acetylcholine. And then acetylcholine has to bind to receptors. So what type of channels will we always find on the postsynaptic neuron? There's three types. There's mechanically gated, ligand gated, and voltage gated. What type of channels would be on the dendrites of my postsynaptic neuron? Ligand gated. Ligand gated, yeah, because if it's going to bind the chemicals, if it's got to bind the acetylcholine, it's got to have ligand gated channels. Are these ligand gated channels out here? No, it's some type of stimulus. It could be light, sound, pressure, touch. So the presynaptic neuron can have a variety of types of channels on its dendrites. But out here in the postsynaptic, it's got to be ligand gated. So like I said, it's not always linear. We have different types of synapses. Again, it's just the space between the two neurons, the synapse. The most common are chemical synapses, which there's a chemical being released. In this case, we see that here. But some are electrical, which means they're the, the two um, neurons are connected by gap junctions. And we're going to talk about this when we get to that particular part. When we get to smooth muscle, we're going to see that. So these are rare but there's a connection between the post and presynaptic neuron by gap junctions. So we're going to see these gap junctions in smooth muscle. But they're not very common. The most common are chemical synapses, and that's what we're going to spend our time. So the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron has synaptic vesicles with neurotransmitters in it. And then there's a receptor region on the postsynaptic neuron. And what did we say that those, the types of channels those are? Yep, ligand-gated channels. Because they're binding a neurotransmitter. All right, we'll stop here.